Welcome everyone to the Maryland Regional Direct Services Collaborative. My name is Jane Marks. I'm the Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, or better known as GWEP, and it's located in the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center campus. Today, our program, um, if you wanna to slide to the next slide, um, we're going to showcase new and innovative training initiatives for the frontline direct service workforce. And today's objective is to showcase organizations challenged by the pandemic that are initiating new and innovative training approaches to enhance the recruitment, retention, and career path development of frontline direct service workers. Well, we all know it's been a challenging year across all healthcare systems, acute hospitals, long-term care, assistant living, and primary care, as well as a challenge for our community programs that support so many, but most important, a challenge to our seniors. The purpose of the Johns Hopkins GWEP is really to develop an integrated geriatric primary care healthcare workforce that maximizes patient and family engagement. We have had um, the fortune to partner with two healthcare organizations in Maryland, Johns Hopkins Community Physicians and MedStar Good Samaritan, working with primary care sites across the state. Our partners also in the GWEP have strengthened and supported our efforts. And they include the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and community organizations including the Alzheimer's Association of Maryland, the Mental Health Association of Maryland, and most important, um, the impact of the Living Well Center of Excellence um, located on the Eastern Shore, but providing evidence-based programs across the state of Maryland. I would like to just mention a little about efforts that the Maryland Gerontological Nurse Group has been doing for years um, and I'm involved in that group. The Cynthia Steele Caring Hands Award is important because it recognizes direct service workers such as nursing assistants, CMAs, techs, um, people that are at the front lines, certified med assistants. And by giving this Caring Hands Award, we bring recognition to someone that's outstanding in their care of a senior. And this has been our 15th year and we're proud to continue that. On the left-hand side, we carried out a little thank you for our nursing assistance at a long-term care and assisted living facility this year during the challenging time. And I think it's important as we hear today, um, programs that involve direct care workers to know th their work and their efforts and appreciation. So with that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Robin Stone. Dr. Stone is the Senior Vice President for Research at Leading Edge and Co-Director of the Leading Edge Long-Term Services and Supports Center in Boston, Massachusetts. She has experience with over 40 years as a researcher and policymaker in long-term care and aging services. She serves as the founding member of the Maryland Regional Direct Service Collaborative. Thank you, Dr. Stone, and welcome. You're on mute. Thank you all so much. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be with, here with all of my friends, uh, many colleagues who I have worked with for quite a long time on this journey. Um, I wanted to start by um, saying that I like to refer to this workforce as direct care or direct support professionals. Um, to my mind, worker um, is a lesser term and I think it adds to the challenge that we all have of recognizing that these are professional occupations with extremely uh, complex needs and competencies that are required for folks to do this job. This is not the butlers and maids of, uh, of, the, uh, of old. And uh, I often tell the story of when I was working for the Pepper Commission in 1989, um, Senator Rockefeller, who was, a, who was a lovely man and was very committed to long-term care reform and very much interested in uh, workforce issues, 
um, asked me to describe to him what frontline caregivers do. And he really did believe that these were basically butlers and maids and people who were babysitting older adults. And it was an educational experience for him and the 11 other congressmen, senators and, and uh, congressmen who were on that commission to understand in 1989 how, how important and essential this workforce is to the underpinnings of our entire system. Fast forward to 2021 and we're still dealing with the same issues. Um, I am hoping that by the time that I finally make a decision to retire, that we will not continue to have the same discussions around should we have good training programs for frontline staff? Should there be, be career advancement opportunities for frontline professionals? Should we be thinking about a living wage for people who do essentially 60 to 80% of all the hands-on care in long-term services and supports? Unlike the hospital and some of the other settings in the LTSS world, in the nursing home and assisted living and in home care, these are the folks who do most of the service delivery. So it is essential for us to understand, number one, the value that these individuals provide every single day to our system. Without them, we are broken, which is one of the reasons why we have seen with COVID-19, it rearing its really ugly head because this combination, this confluence of continued undervaluing of our system and of the frontline professionals who do this work, added to that the high risk that many of these individuals uh, met both within the organizations that they were working in as well as in the communities that they live in just added to these challenges. And um, I am happy to say that probably one of the highlights or the shining lights of this pandemic is the fact that so much attention is being paid to this frontline workforce. I will, however, say that I've been through this game before. Uh, in fact, every time we have a challenge in our economy and then, then the economy revs up again and we see a lot of turnover, people start worrying about the frontline because they have shortages. And I think our message here today is we need to have programs that recognize this is not just a shortage issue. It is a professional occupation concern that is the only way that we are gonna produce quality. You do not get quality in any of our systems without staff being trained and supported and having the, the skills, the knowledge, and the ability to actually produce and to have opportunities for growth. Um, I'm really excited about hearing about some of these new opportunities because I think it is extremely important for, under, for us to understand a couple of things. First of all, training is important, but not sufficient. Training is the, is the gateway, the gateway and the ongoing sustenance of uh, people being able to gain knowledge and skills, but it is the system that has to support this frontline professional staff. Training alone will not create better quality and better working conditions and higher pay and an investment in this workforce. So we have to think about training as one of the building blocks, to actually providing a competent quality set of individuals who then have the support both financially as well as in the workplace to actually do their jobs and to have the opportunities to grow, which means we have to take a look at things like the Nurse Delegation Acts. How flexible are our nurse delegation rules these days in Maryland? to allow our frontline professionals to actually perform to the highest level that is possible for them with good supervision. What are the work practices in all of our provider organizations? I represent, I work at leading age. We have over 6,000 aging services, nonprofit aging services providers in our membership across the country. Leading age Maryland is, is uh, our state affiliate. And I will tell you that it is a struggle every day to keep providers eyes on the prize, which is that if you don't invest in staff and if you do not have a healthy, strong workplace, you cannot possibly produce better quality outcomes. Infection control is not possible without a competent quality staff 
who knows what they're doing, has the expertise to handle it, and has the support and the, and the flexibility to be able to pivot and do the kind of work that was needed during this pandemic. And quite honestly, and, and I'm someone who's been looking at workforce for many, many years, I don't think we put enough time and effort into the human capital infrastructure. We're more worried about the, the newest bells and whistles of our technology, of our electronic health record. And as I always say, an electronic health record does not produce quality outcomes. <laughs> It's actually the people who produce quality outcomes. So I think we need to think about training in a much broader way. Training that is tied to wraparound services for many of our workforce on the front line who are disadvantaged living in very, very complicated uh, situations outside of the workplace. Um, and until we get a livable wage and a real recognition of this front line as professionals who should be paid for what they're doing, we have to pay attention to their external needs, childcare, transportation, even food. So this is an extremely important piece of training and the best training programs that I have seen around the country have embedded in them all of these wraparound services to support these individuals, to be able to have an optimal experience, to be graduated from these programs, to get excellent placements, and then have the support on the job to actually do what they were trained to do. When we have interviewed aides, and I've been doing this work for many, many years as a researcher, their main challenge is not even money. Their main challenge is their supervisors. Their main challenge is the lack of investment at the, work, at the, at the workplace, to have them built into teams so that they are an equal partner. How many times have I seen a huddle room where there is not one aide in the room. Now you tell me what other organization where 60 to 80% of care is provided by individuals who never are part of the huddle team every morning to talk about individual patients or clients. So we have to turn this on its head. I think we have an incredible opportunity here. We're at a moment where everybody's talking about the front line. You can't, you know, you can't miss a few days without seeing something in the social media. I've been to many, many roundtables talking about this, talking about this, talking about this. And I think our regional collaborative has an opportunity to help with our partners like the GWEP in, uh, at, at Johns Hopkins and like other organizations, certainly PHI, Charlene's group, Kevin, uh, Stephanie, everybody that's on this panel today to help us move this into action. It's got to be multi-pronged. Training is not sufficient, but it is essential. And I think that these new programs that recognize training more broadly, think about a career advancement that by the way, does not just have to end up in nursing. Um, many aides are fantastic people, person people, and they need to be thinking about other careers in social work, in human resources management, in other types of management. Some of the best nursing home administrators that I have met in my over 40 year career started out as a CNA. So we have a lot of opportunity for career ladders and career lattices that go way beyond just nursing. It's a great profession for those who want it. But many aides that we have interviewed really don't want to move into nursing. They actually love aid work. They want to specialize in dementia care, in wound care, in medication management in people management. So let's think broadly, let's think uh, creatively in terms of how we use our apprenticeship programs and our other opportunities for career advancement to go way beyond sort of the narrow lens that we have put on this over the many years that I've been watching this sector and being part of this sector. And um, with that, I think I will uh, stop here, turn it back to um, our wonderful panel I look forward to the discussion and uh, for me, hope springs eternal that we will not next year, post COVID, hopefully, be having the same discussions around, you know, how can we create better training programs? How can we create more career advancement? But that actually we have recognized that these are professions that require substantial investment in, in all of the different aspects that are going to make this whole and are gonna help us to produce better quality for the people that we're caring for.
So thank you. Sorry, thank you, Robin, so much for such powerful information and certainly um, enthusiasm about your mission. I appreciate that. As a prior CNA to my career, <laughs> I relate to many things that you've said. And one comment that comes to my mind when you talked about technology is uh, a comment that was made in a meeting when we were looking at uh, some technology equipment for our facility in regards to a comment made is we really need low tech, high touch. It's all about the touch. And so I appreciate that comment that you made in that regard. And certainly um, how we can support our, our nursing assistants and other direct workers into advancing. I think that is so important. I'd like to continue and introduce our moderator for the next session, and that is Stephen Campbell. Stephen is data and policy analysis at uh, PHI, which is nationally recognized for its skills-based approach to improve the training and support of the direct services workforce. Stephen provides technical assistance to employers and other community-based organizations, and he will moderate our next uh, panel. Thank you. Um, like everyone here on the call today, I am so thrilled to hear from our panelists today. I think that in the midst of this crisis, uh, we are so concerned, obviously, with the immediate safety concerns of this workforce, the immediate uh, challenges in building sustainable pipelines during a crisis. But if we look up and look to the future, from 2019 to 2029 alone, we'll need to fill 7.4 million direct care job openings across the country. Uh, the this, this story is similar at the regional and state level as well. So we need to obviously address these immediate concerns, but also look to the future and innovate and uh, build pipelines for, for strong competency development for this workforce in the long run. And I, I think that our panelists will do just that today. I'm gonna to start by introducing each of our panelists. Um, they'll each have about 10 minutes to share some of their work and some of the innovation and creativity that they're engaged in. But I do encourage you uh, throughout uh, this panel discussion to share your comments and your questions either in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or the chat box. And at the end of this panel discussion, we'll turn it back over to Jane and I'll assist in sort of highlighting questions that come through in the chat box and the Q&A box. So hopefully we'll have some time to address them. And if not, of course, we'll find ways to get you in touch with the panelists or others to make sure that your questions get addressed. Uh, so our panel today will be comprised of, of three uh, innovators in the field, uh, starting with Kevin Hefner, uh, the president of the Lifespan Network, the largest senior care provider association in the Mid-Atlantic, representing more than 250 senior care provider organizations in Maryland and DC. Kevin is going to describe Lifespan Network's proposal submitted to the Maryland Board of Nursing to create highly qualified nurse aides toward meeting the ever-increasing healthcare demand. And next, we'll hear from Stephanie Schreiber, a career transitions coordinator at Lorian Health Services, a family owned nursing home company and recognized leader in health services across the region. Lorian's vision is to find and adapt to the ever changing trends in healthcare technology with the end goal of maximizing the quality of life for its clients. Today, Stephanie will describe Lorian's new career ladder program to provide a meaningful career path from the temporary nursing aid all the way up to a licensed practical nurse. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Charlene Brown, CEO and founder of CNA Simulations VR, an ed tech company that is building a first of its kind suite of virtual clinical simulations for frontline healthcare workers. Uh, I'm struck uh, by the terminology we've used thus far. It sounds like uh, this new venture will be both high touch and high tech. Uh, Dr. Brown will describe how the CNA, CNA simulations VR, uh, starting with clinical training of CNAs, is imagining new ways to grow the pipeline of direct care workers through education and innovation. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Kevin. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, it is a, it's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. I want to applaud uh, 
the Rodham Institute, Ron Carlson, uh, for this important work and continuing this important conversation. It's uh, particularly for me uh, an honor to follow Dr. Stone, someone who I've worked with for many, many years, and um, am, am just so grateful that we've got her in this field. Um, she is a game changer and has been for a long time, and it's just a um, just, just grateful to, to, to be part of this with her and with you. So I want to talk a little bit about um, something that we are beginning uh, in Maryland as it relates to uh, training and certification. Um, Christina, can you skip to the next one? Uh, we've got a bunch of animations, so feel free to just sort of power through them. Um, I promise that uh, I did not collaborate or, or uh, coordinate with Dr. Stone. Um, go back to the last slide, but um, back in 1989, uh, as, as she was mentioning, um, Lifespan, or as it was known then, MANFA, did a member survey, something we did in, in paper, uh, using paper back then. Uh, and when we were moving about three years ago, we stumbled on a member survey from 1989. And the proverbial question was asked, of our members, what keeps you awake at night? The answer was staffing. Um, so fast forward 32 years later, we're still talking about this issue. Um, and in some ways uh, it's, it's gotten even more complex. So um, when uh, uh, COVID um, really uh, sort of burst onto the scene um, and changed everything that we do uh, a little over a year ago, um, it, it exacerbated things for us. Um, Christina, feel free to drop down. Um, everything from positive tests um, to, you can go ahead and go through all the animations. Positive tests, negative news stories, insufficient PPE, call outs, all of those things that, that we all experienced. Agency price gouging uh, really changed and made things more difficult, more challenging for providers. Uh, than they had already been, uh, as I described, for the past 30 plus years. Um, and so we began to talk about, uh, go ahead and move to the next slide, um, the barriers that exist. Um, and you can fast forward through all my animations. Um, in Maryland, there um, are no statewide online programs available for um, CNAs and GNAs in order to, to become certified. Um, it's a real barrier, particularly now under COVID, um, given that uh, community colleges are just reopening, you can't get to the classroom, um, and classes uh, in person in the classroom obviously are synchronous programs. And so if you have a job uh, during the day that, that doesn't allow you to participate in classes, if you have childcare issues, if you have transportation issues, um, those are real um, significant barriers to being able to do uh, the uh, to do uh, the the nursing certification programs, um, and so we took into account all of those barriers that existed, and we approached um, Christine. You can go to the next slide. We approached um, the Maryland Board of Nursing uh, about the possibility of being able to introduce an online certification program that would be available to everyone across the state, um, given all of the barriers that exist to entry into the field. So, you know, when you think about how difficult we make it collectively for someone to become certified uh, in uh, and become a, a nursing assistant, a CNA or a GNA, um, it's really difficult uh, to get into this field. Um, and uh, if, if you uh, have been recently separated from your job in hospitality, uh, if you've lost your job in a restaurant, in a hotel, you may not have a job to go back to. And we recognized um, early on in the process that unemployment was going to run out and you may not have a job to go back to. Well, not, why not find a way to create opportunities in a field uh, for, for people to transition from hospitality uh, roles to a field that really desperately needs them. So we um, developed a partnership with Relias, um, well known probably to many of you as a company that does uh, both online and classroom-based training programs across the country um, to help us navigate through this process. 
we began to talk with the Maryland Board of Nursing and MHEC, the Maryland Higher Education Commission, uh, about what we would need to do in order to introduce a new program and start to break down the barriers that exist. I'll add also that one of the partners that um, one of our members, um, Lorian, uh, who uh, we've been talking to throughout this process, great member, great partner. Um, I talked with the CEO, Lou Grimmel, early on about uh, the fact that uh, Lorian and other providers were having a great deal of success with um, given the COVID relaxation of requirements for people to practice uh, in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, family members, friends were all joining in, um, contributing their, uh, their efforts um, and discovering uh, without having to be certified uh, during the pandemic that they really loved the work and really wanted to continue on. Uh, and so Lou and I began having a conversation about, gosh, what if we could get people into the field get them some experience, and then allow them to go through the certification process once they've determined that it's something that they wanna do, that they wanna make uh, their career. Um, so we developed some regional partnerships with provider members of ours around clinicals. We recognized that if we could do the didactic, um, the uh, classroom-based education um, online, we need to have some partners around the state who could help with clinicals, uh, who already have established programs, uh, and so partnered with uh, our members all around the state to set up a process whereby once we launch the program, they'd be able to support having, uh, having uh, uh, the clinicals uh, take place in their facilities. Um, so we submitted the, the Maryland Board of Nursing application uh, just about a month or so ago to, to offer this online program statewide. Our expectation um, in our conversations with them is that we'll hear back uh, within about two months uh, we also submitted an application to the Maryland Higher Education Commission, which um, has regulatory control for all new uh, educational programs uh, in the state of Maryland um, and recognizing that we would need to become a trade school. So that uh, application is 60 pages long, just the application. Uh, and so we're in the process of navigating our way through that. We're hopeful to have that done within uh, the next two or three weeks. Um, but this all points towards creating a program that's asynchronous, that if you have childcare issues, if you have another job, you can take this class on a paced, uh, 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 in a paced way in the middle of the night. You can take it at midnight. You can, as long as you're making your marks on a weekly basis uh, and progressing through the course, you can do it in as asynchronous fashion. You don't have to worry about the childcare issues, the job issues, the transportation barriers, uh, or the, the, the relative concerns about COVID uh, and going into a community college or a trade school uh, environment. So that's where we are now. And uh, Christine, you can move on to the, the final slide. Uh, we recognized also that tuition is, is a challenge. And so I'm part of the, the Governor's Workforce Development Board. We began talking about the fact that uh, GWDB has um, lots and lots of dollars uh, for apprenticeship programs that could be used, could be repurposed uh, in order to provide scholarships so that if you're transitioning out of uh, a restaurant job and you want to do this program, I talked about in the last slide all the barriers that we removed. One of the biggest barriers is financial. If you've lost your job, you don't have $1,000 or $1,200 to spend on a certification program. So those scholarship dollars we're hoping We'll have through the Governor's Workforce Development Board, Department of Labor. Uh, also, our longtime partner, Morgan Keller, has agreed to repurpose ongoing scholarship dollars that uh, had been provided to existing CNAs and GNAs so that they could continue their college education or go to college for the first time. Um, we're repurposing those dollars for this program so that we can provide additional scholarship support eliminating the financial barriers that exist. So really what we're, um, uh, we're working on here is just trying to create something new that will uh, eliminate barriers, help more people to see a path into the field um, and uh, to, to uh, move from perhaps hospitality into a field that desperately needs them. So we're excited about it. Um, we've talked about virtual reality, and I know Dr. Brown's going to be talking about that for, for clinicals um, so that it could be completely online at some point. 
um, but we're just excited about the future. And um, so that's all I have. It is my uh, distinct privilege uh, to be able to hand the baton to uh, Stephanie Shriver with Lorian, who is uh, going to, to, to take things uh, from here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And thank you to Stephen for the introduction um, with Lorian. And thank you to the collaborative for including us. Um, I'm excited to talk about our career ladder program that um, we've been working on since the fall. And um, I'll just say that Lorian is a uh, skilled nursing community. We have nine communities all together. Um, in, we are in Baltimore, Hartford, Howard, and Carroll County. Um, we offer subacute rehab, skilled nursing, and also assisted living. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of overlap from what Kevin um, talked about as well, but uh, Lorian is the second largest employer in Howard County, um, but we have been facing our shared recruitment challenges as well with um, COVID has not helped that at all. Um, more long term care workers are leaving the industry than are coming into it. Um, so we realized that we had to do something. Um, we were about 120 GNAs short between all of our nine facilities. Um, majority of the decline was seen over nursing and uh, the GNA positions. Same kind of thing that Kevin touched on, you know, staff had fear of COVID-19 and PPE shortages in the beginning. If nurses were close to retirement, they just chose to go ahead and retire early. Negative press coverage, um, COVID fatigue, family obligations, childcare, homeschooling, all of those things just posed a ton of challenges. So we realized we needed to do something quickly um, and Lorian saw an opportunity in the state. Uh, you can switch to the next slide, Christina, thank you. Um, they saw an opportunity in the state approved uh, temporary eight hour online nursing assistant program. Um, we have tried to really market to rest restaurant and hospitality industries that have suffered a lot of loss. Um, and we've also opened it up and heavily um, marketed to our existing Lorian employees that want um, career growth, uh, like Dr. Stone touched on. You know, this is a we're we're looking at this as a profession. This isn't just a job to get you through to the next thing. This is really something that we're investing a lot of time and money into, and really hoping that people look at this as a career. Um, so, as you can see in the graphic there, the temporary nursing aid is the is the start of the ladder. Um, and then we will try, we'll provide the, the certification for GNA. Um, if you're an employee in good standing, you can move up to the certified med medicine aid. We'll pay for that certification and training. And then on to LPN and registered nurse is the top of the, that career ladder. So like I said, we've marketed the program throughout Lorian. Um, we've, it's on social media, we have radio ads. Um, the new new candidates go through an initial screening process, and then they're asked to take that eight hour online class. Once that class is passed, um, then we have we provide a three day in person hands on skills training with um, our instructor Susan Carroll. She's the VP of clinical with Lorian. Um, though it's 24 hours total, and that's something that the state isn't mandating, but Lorian is paying and offering so that our candidates are completely trained um, before we put them into the facility. Classes right now are being held at Lorian Columbia and Lorian Bel Air. We're alternating weeks. So we have one class each week. Six people are, are our max right now. Um, eventually our goal is to host two classes every week. Um, once the candidate finishes the three day in person, they get a $275 check. Um, and before the candidates enter any of our facilities, they're tested um, for COVID, obviously, before they're, they enter any of our buildings. Uh, the next slide, that's just a photograph of our first two CNA classes that have graduated. Um, so we're really super proud of those people. Um, each candidate that finishes the class, they're matched up they get to choose which location they'd like to work at. Um, and they're assigned a mentor. They get at least 80 hours of mentorship on the floor. They also have to complete a skills checklist before they're kind of off and running on their own. Um, 
we we recognize also like Dr. Stone mentioned that retention is a huge issue. Um, so we're we are financially rewarding our mentors um, with cash bonuses several times throughout. They follow their candidate for one whole year. So this is regular touch points, regular, you know, conversations with that with that employee, just making sure that things are going well. Um, and that mentor is financially rewarded by, you know, keeping contact with the, the people that they have trained. Um, both the mentors and mentees are asked to provide feedback on the process and how things are going to their supervisors and also to corporate. Um, so far, we have 20 graduates. We'll have six more by the end of this week. And I actually believe the 30 candidates in the queue is up to 59 right now. So we're this this program is gaining a lot of traction and having a lot of success. Um, a lot of our internal employees that are GNAs right now are interested in moving into nursing school. Um, and these are obviously employees that have been with us for a period of time. They have recommendations by their supervisor and their employees in good standing. Um, Lorian has decided to pay for 100% of the tuition up front. Um, and also, if the, if the candidate needs it, if the employee needs it, they're also offering to you know, supplement their income in order to have them in classes full time. So the big question is now, how do we sustain this? You know, not only the, the hours and manpower it takes to train all these CNAs, but also, you know, the tuition cost and things like that. So um, you can, yeah. So the, the big question that we have right now is bridging the temporary nursing assistant certification with GNA certification. Um, we're hoping that some of our community partners like Lifespan could potentially offer an online GNA course. Hopefully that gets approved and um, looking for any other possibilities. A lot of our CNAs, they hear the word temporary and they're, you know, they're panicking, but we're seeing that some other states have already um, included these people in their um, certific certified CNAs. So we're hoping that Maryland follows suit on that. Um, we're also hoping that we can find some state or county funded programs that can supplement the cost of the nursing assistant program and also help match um, the tuition dollars that Lorraine is paying for this career ladder. Um, we just need to keep moving the innovation forward. So that's that's really what, what needs to happen right now. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about our career ladder. And I'd like to now introduce Dr. Charlene Brown, who is the CEO and founder of CNA Simulations. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And it's a pleasure to be here with so many old friends and new ones. And I'm just excited to share what we're doing with CNA Simulations VR. So I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, can you see my screen yet? Okay, so last year, um, Kevin and Robin actually know this, last year I had an idea. I had, this was my, I, I was working on a different startup company and I just had a, a lot of networks who were, um, working in CNA instruction and they were all really stressed out and worried because the pandemic had limited their ability to create clinical training experiences for their students. And, and I thought that was a little bit ridiculous because clinical virtual clinical simulation tools are normative in nursing education, in medical education, I'm a physician, surgical training, and I just didn't understand why frontline direct service professionals didn't have access to advanced learning tools particularly during such a time of crisis. Well, I went from an idea to an actual project when Dr. Leahy heard what I was thinking about and decided that his high school health education foundation, which actually funds CNA training in DC, Maryland and Utah for high school students, he decided that this was a necessary, it was necessary to build out a suite of virtual clinical simulations for CNAs. And I agreed. And so CNA simulations VR was born went from an idea to an actual vision. So what is our vision? Our vision is to create virtual clinical simulations. So what is a simulation, right? A simulation is how you, um, without actually taking care of a live person, 
go through the process of making the types of decisions that you would make when you're taking care of a live person, only you're doing it. You can do it in a lab, you can do it in person, you can have actors, or you can do it online. And so we are building an online virtual clinical simulation framework that uses three-dimensional characters in three-dimensional settings. Um, you can see Teresa here is pulling the privacy curtain and users, students can use their cell phones, they can use tablets, they can use computers in order to immerse themselves in this this fictional world in which they're taking care of an older adult. The beauty of virtual clinical simulations is that you can do a lot of the things that Kevin was talking about. If you can reduce the reliance on in-person clinical rotations, even before the pandemic, so many training programs struggled to get enough, um, struggled to get enough rotation sites for their students. If we can, we can mirror what is done in nursing training where a percentage of your clinical time can be done in simulation, we can enroll more students in schools, we can graduate more CNAs and have more direct service professionals available for older adults in our country. So, the CNA simulations are eight, they have eight parts. First, there are, well, actually, let me, I'm gonna show you the eight parts. Now, did your screen change? It did not. Okay, so there's a, the student starts by being introduced to a patient and seeing the care plan. They go through a pre-assessment, then they enter the simulation, they go through a post-assessment, review their performance analytics. They have the opportunity to document as they would in the facility. They go through a reflection process with guided questions and then debrief with their instructors, either in individual or group settings. So now I'm gonna just take you on a short journey to see what we have so far for our simulations. So this is Teresa, the CNA, the fictional CNA student who's about to start her clinical rotation. She has to decide what to do standing outside the door of Ms. Williams' room. So let's say she knocks on the door, she'll hear the knocking, but if there's no answer, what is she supposed to do? Should she just step in or should she knock on the door again? She's knocking the door again. Um, our simulations will include a combination of audio. So when Sophie says, yes, come in, um, you would actually hear that. And then we have a fictional character called Nurse Johnson who is a CNA instructor who is constantly popping up, giving feedback on the choices that the student makes. So now that you've entered the room, you have to make decisions. Um, each time this character makes a decision in simulation, it's a decision that the student or the user is making on behalf of Teresa. So let's say, let's choose a wrong answer, right? So now you get feedback from Nurse Johnson that perhaps that wasn't the right thing to do. So I'll stop there. We could, this, could, this goes on for quite a while, but I wanted to introduce you to this concept of simulation, um, make it clear that this is not a new concept. So virtual clinical simulations are normative in nursing and medical education. I believe that CNAs and other frontline workers deserve the access to the advanced learning tools that everybody else has, not only because it will help to advance the pipeline of caregiving professionals to care for older adults, but because it's just right, right? De it democratize, I describe what we're doing as democratizing access to advanced learning tools for CNAs. So we plan to start with CNAs and move from CNAs to other, front, other verticals within healthcare where, that are neglected. Any kind of person, any person that works in a facility or in home care or just anywhere in medicine, actually, if you have to touch a patient, there's a clinical part to your training. And I believe that everybody should have access to virtual clinical training tools who's involved with the care of older adults, whether it's a supplement to their clinical, on-site clinical training or an adjunct. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. So thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to Stephen and it's a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thank you so much, Charlene. Um, so we have a little time left here to do Q&A. 
Um, some of you have already raised questions in the chat, so I'll be sure to highlight those for Jane. Uh, but Jane is going to facilitate the Q&A, so uh, go ahead and you have the floor, Jane. Thank you, Stephen. Um, certainly um, a, lot of, a lot of information this morning, and I appreciate, as I'm sure our participants do, hearing from all the various innovative ideas that are out there, which are exciting um, to hear. And as I think someone mentioned, bravo to all. So um, thank you. Let's go to some questions, though, um, in regards that are in the chat room in the Q&A um, session. Um, one question comes from Dana is, how can higher education working with foundations, policy legislators, and professional associations move this important agenda forward? Um, Kevin, do you have any response to that? Since I think you've kind of been working with a lot of various groups here. Yeah, I do. And actually, have uh, Dana been, um, have, have been texting a little bit back and forth. I, I, there are some great opportunities um, for collaboration with higher education. I think, you know, the, the making programming certification um, uh, available in as many uh, different uh, uh, locations, as many different uh, delivery mechanisms as possible really benefits everyone. Um, part of what uh, the Maryland Higher Education Commission does, as many of you know, is to ensure that uh, educational programs, particularly among universities and community colleges, aren't competing uh, necessarily with each other. But in this case, where we're looking to fill uh, work, a workforce need that's just huge, as Stephen uh, outlined, I think you know, we, we could use some partnerships where we sort of put some of the competitiveness aside and uh, figure out ways that universities and colleges um, can work to support these kinds of private programs um, and to make them available um, you know, using uh, other, other mechanisms. So maybe making some of the content available through community colleges and, and uh, universities. Um, so I think there are a lot of possibilities. I think we're um, on the precipice of, of, of some really cool new stuff. Um, but I think we, we all need to um, be mindful to, um, to, to, to work together uh, as we have through the pandemic to help each other. Thank you, Kevin. Does anyone else have thoughts? Robin, I saw you. Yeah. Cut your Jane, head. I do have a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, I think the GWEPs, for those who don't know the GWEP, um, these, these programs are uh, extremely important in terms of training and connections with community. And I'm actually part of the Elder Care Workforce Alliance, which is the group that advocates uh, with um, the American Geriatric Society for the GWEPs, and we actually were able in the last iteration of legislation to get a focus on both training family caregivers and training frontline professionals, which had never been part of the GWEP uh, responsibility before. And so I think pushing more around how do we get schools, higher education to partner with community providers be it a nursing home, assisted living, home care, how do we get them to partner around training and on the ground training, practical, pragmatic training and investment in thinking about this? I think there's a really great role for the GWEPs in all of our, all of the places, all of the higher education entities around the country. The other is, is that I, I talked about uh, supervision, but I, I want to come back to this again because I think one of the problems that we have is that we don't have an infrastructure in our organizations to actually help frontline professionals thrive. And I think the higher education institutions need to be doing a much better job of training nurses, training social workers, training others who are actually in, in managerial positions, supervisory positions to actually understand what it means to work with frontline and how do you build teams? Um, empowerment and team building and equal access as, as Charlene was saying, everyone ha should have access to, uh, to these new training modalities. 
everyone should have access to being an equal partner of a team when you are actually providing services. So I think there's also opportunities for us to partner with uh, both foundations and um, various educational entities to actually think about how do we create teams around this and how do we start with the schools and then take it into the clinical spaces, to actually have this happen on the ground. So I think those partnerships are really essential. The other thing, of course, is advocacy. You know, more voices around investment uh, can really help to put some dollars on the table. So. Thank you, Rob, and I agree. And I do have to make comment. It was one of my excitement when the GWEPs did expand to, to include those direct care workers and CNAs and other caregivers. And that's been a large part of our work um, these last two cycles, as well as with our um, partnering organizations. They have become vital, the Alzheimer's Association, the Well Center, and the Maryland Health Mental Health Association all have provided great resource and education reaching out to direct care workers in various facilities. So it, it has been, um, I think, a wonderful change in, in their um, um, outreach, to be honest, so thank you. Um, Stephanie, do you have any thoughts in regards to being right there on the line here in Laurian, um, that regard? Uh, it's the, the direct care workers and the, the higher education, we, we are looking right now to try to partner with some local colleges, community colleges, those talks are in the works right now. Um, I don't think we've actually um, ironed anything out yet, but that's, that's really a big piece of what we're missing. I just have a question in regards to, I think, stuff that Dr. Brown mentioned. Are you doing simulation in your online training at all, or is it just more online? Just curious. Yeah, we, we aren't. We're doing, uh, we're, we're accepting the candidates after they complete the eight-hour online course, which is not simulated at all. And then we're doing a hands-on uh, three-day skills training with, you know, kind of the old school mannequins and things like that. But I'm I'm super interested in what Dr. Brown talked about. I'm, I was, I'm taking that back to our team for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I just see that as a nice partnership and adjunct and then your mentorship program. I, I love the fact that you're having nursing assistants mentor each other, which I think is so important. One, it not only, um, you know, certainly encourages those new staff, but you're, you're empowering that staff member that's been there, showing them that you, you know, have trust and belief and that, you know, they're exemplifying what you believe in for a facility and care for that person. So kudos to you. Our, our, our wonderful CEO, Lou, is actually um, personally traveling to each of the facilities and meeting those mentors one-on-one -on -one and just really thanking them and making sure they understand how critical they are to this entire plan working. So he's, he's personally giving them that, that white glove treatment, which I think is, is gonna go a long way. You know, I, ju I, I just wanna say that we have done a number of studies of peer mentoring programs in both nursing homes and in home care. And the outcomes are very, very strong. Um, we've actually stood up a number of peer mentoring programs on our Leading Age website, try to get our members and others to use them. It's a really hard thing to get people to use them in practice. And the truth is everybody should have a mentoring program as part of onboarding and then on an ongoing basis. And you can see it's, it's one of the sort of elements of best practice that would make such a difference for all of us. So it's fantastic that you're doing it, Stephanie, and we need to sort of get the word out. You know, I keep thinking, are there five essentials that have to happen, you know, that if everybody did, we'd be in such better place. So it's terrific that you guys are doing that. Um, thank you all. There's another question that um, is from uh, Ravia who says, we need to redefine the service delivery models to enable $45 an hour and reimbursement value delivered so that we can pay our frontline workers $20 an hour and a 40 hour week. Are you seeing efforts to make one to many service delivery models that can make this possible? You know, it's a complicated 
question because the service delivery model is also dependent on payment and reimbursement. And so it's not as though providers, I mean, I have seen unbelievably creative providers using the resources that are available and to actually create much more opportunity and not necessarily raising the wages to what you were talking about, but paying more because they have actually created teams in their organizations. They have significantly reduced turnover, which then gets applied back into the actual wages and compensation of frontline professionals. And that is being done within the current structures. But the truth of the matter is, if we wanted to take these things to scale, I mean, think about if everybody had a really robust onboarding, mentoring program, team-based approaches that built people in. First of all, you would reduce, on the long-term, you'd reduce turnover substantially and that retention in and of itself would save money to plow back in. But you've got a lot of time where you have to build that. So it's not as simple as thinking about a redesigned service delivery model. There has to be the other stakeholders engaged in this too, which are the payment, you know, Medicaid and Medicare. The other, the colleges and educational institutions that are creating the, the, the educational content, the workforce development people, the WIBs that are investing in the jobs, it, it all has to go together. So I think that a service delivery model in and of itself, I don't think can solve the problem, but it's certainly, you have to have a vision of how your service delivery model is going to change in order to improve for the, for the professionals and also for the people that we care for actually. Does anyone else have any thoughts or comments from our panel? All right, well, let me move on to the next question. Um, have you been able to track the number of new trainees that come from perhaps hospitality or restaurant occupations? Just curious as to maybe how many are connecting to these occupations and seeing them as a viable career or alternative to their pre, uh, past position. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't have an exact percentage, but I know that personally I've spoken to a large percentage of the candidates and many of them are coming from the restaurant industry. You know, I can think of one in particular that when COVID first started, she was actually a um, cafeteria worker at her local school system. Um, so many, many, many examples of that. And not, not maybe so much from like the hotel industry, but more from the restaurant industry. And, you know, we're really trying to link up that those, um, those personality traits and that made them such a great hospitality worker parallel exactly the same traits that we're looking for in healthcare. So it's it's been a really good um, a really good way to, to try to explain and show people those parallels. Has anyone else seen any um, results of the industry shift? Kevin? I can only speak um, anecdotally. I think you know everything that that Stephanie mentioned. We've seen and heard um, from the Governor's Workforce Development Board. At one point, there were sixty thousand um, hospitality workers who in Maryland were out of work. Um, and again, anecdotally speaking, um, there does seem to be a real alignment um, between the the skill sets and the desires to serve um, others. Um, but I think it, it goes to a, a broader question um, that we can't tackle in this time frame. But you know, we need to do a better job of painting a picture. You know, we're, what I've been talking about, we've been talking about, is career changers. We need to do a better job in a macro sense of painting a picture so that people who are uh, traditional high school age, even middle school age, can see themselves in this kind of role none of us would really blink twice to go into a high school and to see college tables set up, traditional four-year recruiting uh, going on, as well as um, the military set up doing recruiting. They are really good at it. We're really not. Um, and I think we need to paint a better picture for people who are younger uh, that might consider a field like this. They're not interested in a four-year college or university. Or they're not interested in the military and may not be interested in trade school per se, becoming an electrician or a plumber. 
But gosh, if we can paint the picture of the career ladder that Stephanie was describing, and this is a, a, a great life. Um, and you know, as Robin has been saying, we need to do better uh, by these professionals. Uh, but if we can do all of those things, uh, I think there's a there's a uh, an opportunity for us to recruit a whole new um, generation of professionals into this field. We just need to paint the picture and give them the resources they need to live. Thank you, Kevin. Which brings me to a point, Kevin. Are we doing anything from the industry side in regards to high school students, maybe as a volunteer group to start that interest? I mean, I will tell you, I was a candy striper at our local hospital when I was a teenager, which got me interested in healthcare. And it just, you know, I went from there and then to nursing school, worked as a nursing assistant while I was in. So, I mean, are we doing things in the industry, health hospitals, nursing homes, is it to maybe encourage some type of volunteer program with, we did have some training, um, but it, it certainly, I will tell you, I can think of several girls that through that program ended up in nursing. I think individual operators like Lorian um, have done a tremendous job. Um, hospitals, some hospitals have done a tremendous job. Um, we uh, have not done a great job at the um, at the industry level in uh, setting up those kinds of, of of opportunities. You know, I was in a in a in a CCRC um, or life plan community right before uh, March of last year, and was sitting in the dining area. And the CEO called over one of the high school student workers and said, hey, would you ever consider working here um, beyond uh, working in the dining hall during the summers um, and, uh, and, and during breaks? And, and he said, you know, I never even really knew this was a thing. So, <laughs> hey, they have jobs in the dining hall over at this yeah. retirement community. And he didn't, you know, I didn't know what a retirement community was, but I needed a job and it's really cool here. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I just wanted to add, there is a fantastic program at the Jewish Home in New York. Um, they have a partnership with all of the high schools in New York City, and they actually have more than volunteers. They have a very, very strong uh, on-site program. There are three different programs. Um, they have uh, graduated well over a thousand people through this program. Many of them have become aides and then gone to higher positions in the Jewish home system, but they all, many others have actually gone on to matriculate to four-year colleges. A couple of them are in medical school. A few of them are in nursing school. Um, it is highly um, recognized in New York. It is, it is supported by New York City. We are trying to actually get that program uh, scaled to some other places because it is such a fabulous partnership between the high schools and, and, and an organization that is committed to bringing young people in and growing them, whether they stay with them or not. And certainly Dr. Leahy and uh, Charlene mentioned him, he is part of our, our board. Um, he has developed a high school program in Gaithersburg um, with one of the life plan communities, Ingleside and has had tremendous success with that. But I think, um, as Kevin was saying, these are mostly one-offs and not a more systemic approach to how do we work with the high schools. And I, I think we have a great opportunity to do this. And I hope we will move with that because I think there's a lot more we can do, especially as we're moving away from everybody has to go to a four-year college, maybe trying to have people think a little bit more broadly in terms of what are other opportunities. Well, I think we've had some, some great um, talk, talks today and presentations that have us all thinking as we're wrapping up here. I see that we're at our time. I'd like to thank our panel members and our keynote speaker. Um, I think it's been a real thought-provoking morning here, and I appreciate everyone's time. The webinar has been recorded and will be available on the website. So if you want to go back and look, um, I can only thank everyone for their efforts to, to really help the workforce, but also improve care for older adults as well. So thank you all and have a great day and have a nice weekend. Fantastic.
Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>